Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Cold War Preppers Tuesday night nonfiction book club. I had to adjust my microphone, so I want to make sure that everybody that you can hear me. It looks like right now we've only got little lone prepper, but uh, how's how's the volume and the mic? Am I placing it properly? Is is it coming across okay? <clears throat> I am having a little bit of problem with my voice, but uh, oh, we just had somebody else join us. Can you hear me? Is everything coming out okay? Can you hear me? Anybody? Everybody? No. No voice. No noise. Hello. Oh, okay, there we go. Finally, I'm seeing some answers. Wow, look at all the great people showing up. Welcome. Gosh, and a whole bunch of names I have not seen before. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, do me a favor and uh, hit the subscribe button and the notify button. That always helps things away. And uh, hopefully it'll give us a thumbs up when you leave this evening or during sometime during the, the, the show. Uh, we are going to be discussing the dark secrets of uh, SHTF survival by Sokol Begovich. I will also tell you the last oh, 40 pages get so graphic uh, that we probably cannot talk about them here on YouTube. So I'm going to strongly encourage that you get this book. This is one of probably the most eye-opening books you're going to get about somebody who has actually survived one year he calls it one year in hell. But this is the story of Sokol Beg Begovich, and he started all this genre of I survived. You know, I, I survived SHTF. So he was during the Bosnian War, um, during the pres President Clinton's um, tenure, and, uh, you know, that was that was devastating. And, and it looks like it's going to happen again. Uh, we're seeing some things happening in Kosovo. And uh, so, you know, it could be... Uh, happening all over again. Now, remember that part of that Sarajevo is the capital, and that's also where Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated, which started World War I. So all these things are happening right there in that same little area. Uh, again, history repeats itself. We also see the uh, the blowing of the dam today in, on the Dnieper, and uh, that provides not only hydroelectric power, but it also provides, when it backs up the Dnieper River, then you've got water pressure. And so that water pressure feeds a canal, basically, that provides the drinking water for what in Russian is called the uh, Klimsky Poloostrov, or the uh, Crimean Half Island Peninsula. Um, and uh, then it also provides all of the cooling water for the Zaporizhnaya uh, nuclear power plant. So they, they may have to close that down. That's the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. And so, uh, you know, th there's a lot of things going on that, that say, hey, we need to pay attention to what Selco is telling us. So let's go ahead and get right into it. We've got 15 people on uh, right now. I've got some of the world's best moderators. Um, and uh, so I want to thank you all for being here. Do me a favor. At the end, I'm going to tell you, let's be kind, polite, and respectful to each other. I'm also going to tell you that at the beginning. If you want to disagree with me, that's okay. We can disagree. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here to share my experiences, my knowledge, my thoughts, and what's right for me. It may not be what's right for you. Uh, so that's okay. You know, we can disagree on what's best for you and what's best for me. They may not be the same thing. However, please be respectful to the other people on uh, the chat and in the chat. Please be kind to them. Please be polite with them. If you start arguing amongst yourselves, if you can't just accept the fact that people think differently, their opinions different from yours, you don't have to win them over. You know, uh, it's okay for them to be different. Uh, you know, that's, that's how they think it's best for them to survive, and that's okay. You know, we can politely share why we believe the ways we do and then leave it at that. You know, we don't have to convert people. There's there's maybe at the end when we write our own books about we survived our year in hell or 10 years in hell or whatever, 
then we can say, okay, this probably in hindsight should have been better. But let's get into it. This is this is just a phenomenal book. Uh, strongly, strongly recommend it. It'll be in the in the show notes down below. If you would like to use my Amazon link, I get two percent of the sales price. I think the book is twenty dollars, so that means I'll make forty cents. Doesn't increase the cost to you. It doesn't decrease the cost to you. It just gives me forty cents to maintain the channel. Now, I will tell you that uh, the the earnings I get from the channel. 30% of my earnings go to what's called the Caring Place. That's our community, our county food bank. 30% go to what's called St. Vincent de Paul. That's the Roman Catholic version of Goodwill. Uh, but we don't have any professional full-time staff. We, we are all volunteers. I, I probably volunteer 30 hours a week. So I uh, went out and saw one uh, neighbor today, and I have two appointments tomorrow. So we're just out there to help people do what we can. So, so your money is going, if you buy a book or anything else using my Amazon affiliate codes, know that your money is going to good reasons or good purposes. So let me start off. I'm just going to read two paragraphs because I think the introductory two paragraphs of this book are phenomenal. Now, just remember, this is a guy who survived the Bosnian war um, in, in the Balkans and the, uh, so these, these are his recollections of what happened to him. So he says, there's a famous survival rule of threes that goes something like this. You can survive three minutes without air, three hours without shelter in harsh weather, three days without water, and three weeks without food. But I never read any survival rule about how long you can survive, for example, by eating grass or spoiled food to meet one third of your needed daily caloric intake while you're under constant physical threat, while you're under a lot of stress because your kid probably has pneumonia and there are no antibiotics, your rifle isn't working, your roof is leaking on your head, there's no electricity, no running water, and each day is hard work to fulfill bare necessities for the bare minimum of existence. Necessities that you did not even think about and took for granted while the system was still out there. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's you know, a, a brutal reality, and that is that we have some pictures in our mind of what SHTF is going to look like, and that could be financial collapse, that can be uh, nuclear war, it can be, you know, whatever. We're going to talk about that tomorrow night, as a matter of fact. Uh, tomorrow night's topic is going to be that there are 80,000 Chinese unaccompanied single military age males who have crossed the border in the, in the last two and a half, three years. And that's more than six divisions worth of, of enemy in our country. And, uh, you know, so what Soko is talking about, you know, could come to fruition here. So we just kind of have to pay attention to what he says. Um, he came across with one of the most brilliant statements that I have. Write this down, uh, tape it to your mirror, think about it. And, and, and make sure it's firmly implanted in your mind. I, I, I love this. And it says, smart people learn from their mistakes. Really smart people learn from other people's mistakes. So, you know, that's telling you, you know, read the books by Selko. Read the books by Venezuelan Prepper, the guy who's been in Venezuela. Read uh, Furfalagire, Fernando Furfalagire's books. Uh, about what happened to him while he was down in Argentina. And he says Argentina uh, during the financial collapse at the turn of millennia. So, you know, there are people who have experienced SHTF, and I think it's critical we pay attention to how they survived, what they survived, what they experienced. And then we can plan around that and say, what do we need to do today to survive what they went through 5, 10, 20 years ago? So let's get into part one, the difference between your plans and reality. Uh, so the media, he says, uh, was basically turning everybody against each other. Uh, they heated up the situation. They were bombarded carefully with loads of information about changes that were coming, changes to the old way of doing things, changes to the norm, changes to th that were uh, – uprooting and, and causing tumult in society and pitting one neighbor against another. 
tell me that's not happening in today's society, that our media is not dividing us even more than we are already divided. They also increased the fear. So what they would do was play the hyperbole game, you know, and exaggerate the outcomes of the other person's thinking against what you are. And we see it, the left, leftist media, the right media, you know, they're, they're using this hyperbole about how the other side is so egregiously wrong. And we're causing that divide to be even more and more uh, broad than it should be. We should be able to talk things out. But we, I mean, you can watch C-SPAN. Our congressmen and senators are no longer talking to each other. They're yelling and accusing each other across the, the aisles. They're talking about hyperbole. <clears throat> I saw uh, there was, a, there was a, a bill that was forfeited in order to come up. You know, the, the Republicans had to give up the RAIN Act in order, and it's R-E-I-N, so RAIN in uh, the power of some of the executive branch, branch uh, governmental agencies so that they didn't have rulemaking authority without approval by Congress. And they gave that up in order to come to a deal over the uh, uh, budget limits or the debt limits, I'm sorry. And um, so so we, I watched C-SPAN today, you know, the accusations both sides, you know, Republicans are doing this and this and it's terrible and, you know, it's, it's ruining our democracy. And, and then the other side is saying the Democrats are doing this and this. Why don't we just, gosh, why can't we talk? Why do we have to accuse each other? Why do we have to get into such hyperbole? It, it's, cra it's crazy. So they increase the, the hate. Hate often comes with fear, especially with fear. And it comes, again, often as a solution to fear. So this is, if we can go back to Kristallnacht in 1932, 1933, and remember that the, the, the Germans were recovering. The Weimar Republic was in, was in terrible economic situation. All the repatriations that they had to do and all of the reparations that they had to do uh, to the other countries as a result of World War I, <clears throat> and it, it bankrupted uh, Germany. And so you had, uh, in, they had a serious depression with hyperinflation. Things were going way out of control. They needed to focus their fear and their hatred on a cause. And that's where you really came up with the anti-Semitic hate of, of the, uh, the Nazi party in, in pre-World War II Germany was they were looking for that scapegoat. And that's what we're doing in our society right now. We're looking for a scapegoat. We're looking for somebody to blame. It's their fault. We're pointing the finger and we're not working with each other. Uh, he says, I witnessed many times innocent people were killed because a public opinion was formed that it's okay to kill them. And it was scary how fast that opinion was formed. And we see the same thing happening in our streets today. Uh, we're seeing people contending with each other in the streets, violent actions going on in the streets. Remember the summer of love, 2021. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's crazy how things are going on. Um, and so he says, you know, one of the rules that, that takes place, especially in an SHTF environment is, Start using common sense. Stop, stop listening to what other people are telling you. I, a guy called me, and, and you know we have a love-hate relationship. He calls me and wants my opinion, but he never stops talking to get my opinion. And uh, so, you know, we just kept. I, I kept trying to tell him, you know, here, here's what's going on, and, and he wouldn't listen. So I just finally hung up, and he texted me. He says, "I'm sorry, we were disconnected." I said, "No, I hung up." I said, "If you want my opinion." wait for me to give you my opinion. Don't quit talking, you know. Uh, and, and since you asked for my opinion and wouldn't accept it, there was no sense continuing the conversation. You know, kind of, I guess in a way, I'm kind of that problem as well. But, um, you know, look, the, the, the context was he was talking about uh, how the Soviet, uh, the, the Soviets, the Russians are complaining about depleted uranium rounds. Well, if you look up depleted uranium, what you find out is depleted uranium has less uranium radioactive content than normal uranium found in the ground. <clears throat> and, uh, but he was talking about how people are, are dying that after, after 
uh, a depleted uranium round has been shot. He, he listens to a lot of that late night TV sh or late night radio stuff. People are dying because of radiation and uh, radioactive clouds have gone over into Poland as a result of the uh, depleted uranium rounds. I said, what I was trying to say was, use common sense. I, I said, let me give you my take on this. I said, my dad uh, was a retired army warrant officer, just like me. Uh, he was air defense. And so he worked with the Hawk missile system uh, until he retired. Then he got a job working for what's called Armaments Command. So he helped design the M1, the M2, and the M3, the Bradley, the, the, the Bradley fighting vehicle, the Bradley scout vehicle, and the M1 tank. Well, after that, he became began working primarily with M1 tanks. And uh, that's the primary source of the depleted uranium round. You would think that somebody who spent 25 years working with depleted uranium rounds would have contracted cancer if firing those rounds downrange and, and then it hits something, it's kinetic energy, it's just a solid shot, it hits something and just lays there and it's causing and it's causing radioactivity and cancer. You'd think that my dad who handled those rounds on a daily basis for 25 years would have gotten some radioactivity or some cancer or something from it, but it didn't happen. So you know, we, we have to start using common sense. I think that's what Selko says is <clears throat> look for common sense solutions. Um, he also says look for, for a person and not for systems. And quite often there's a person who's trying to get power, who is going to be manipulating these things. And he says, be warned. Uh, it becomes dangerous when you start to act based on completely wrong information. Boy, golly, have we seen a lot of that recently. Uh, or to form your whole survival setup based on wrong information. <clears throat> and so, you know, I, I think one of the key things we have to do is we have to step back and we have to ask ourselves, does this make sense? Are there instances I can think of that counter what's being said? Are there instances I can think of that support what is being said? Does it make sense? Does it not make sense? Another good one, I guess, that we could talk about, you know, is contrails. Uh, there's this fear of chemtrails. And, you know, chemtrails, I think what it was, was, you know, they, they take a look at the chemtrails, which are basically, you take a look at the people, the, the airplanes laying fertilizer, you know, and that shows a chemtrail. And then there's also the, the, the cloud seeding. So there are airplanes that have chemicals that they're dropping from the airplane, usually silver nitrate, trying to form clouds so that they can cause rain to happen in areas. So that's weather manipulation. So then you take those two and you extrapolate that and you say, ah, those condensation trails, which are evaporating uh, hot moisture in, in a cold area, like when you step outside in the winter and you, you know, you can see your condensation trail from your mouth, hot from that 98.6 degree weather inside your body to 32 degree weather outside, it forms this little, we can call it a chemical trail, a chem trail, right? Uh, because you're poisoning everything around you, but it's a condensation trail. And so now what we've done is we, because maybe one in a million of those contrails or chemtrails, people believe that every contrail in the sky is a chemtrail. And you have to ask yourself, is, do you think that's really true? And, and do you, does that make sense? Okay, let me, that kind of ends, ends that one little area in this, in the first portion of the book. Let me check your comments and then we'll continue on. So, okay, everybody is hearing me. That's good. Um, no clicking tonight. No, no stuff. KP Heathen, what, greetings from Louisiana, next door neighbor. Yeah, I'm in Central Texas. Pat Butler, good to see you. KP Heathen. Uh, Rocky, the, the gyro knot. Wow. Diana too. Welcome. No KP heathen. We've said that Pat Butler, Lisa B. Hello. Um, is that bass hog or base hog? I'm going to say bass hog probably because you're a fisherman. Um, Holly Ivins. Good evening and welcome. Let alone prepper. One of my favorites, uh, Diana too. Um, gosh, Holly, so many. Hello, Tofu, one of my great uh, moderators. Isn't she great? Um, let me see. Just so many great people. I am so lucky to have you all. Thank you so much for being here. Just unbelievable. Um, 
Yeah, so so some of his family hidden in he's also in here talking about some of his experiences in the city and, and how he was sniped at as he was going to forage for food and to trade for Zippo lighters and things like that. So uh, they were actually in an urban area as well. <clears throat> um, yeah, and so so now that's what we need to do, though, let alone prepper, is we need to say, Okay, think of the circumstances that uh, uh, you know little uh, that that uh, uh, Soko is giving us, and then are there solutions to it? And you know, as far as having he he talks in one of his books, one of his other books, <clears throat> about a guy who traded. <coughs> oh, oh, I have not been able to get my my vocal cords working all day today. One of his other books, he talks about a guy who d got a four-day regimen of antibiotics for his wife for one ounce of gold. Uh, so an ounce of gold right now is about $2,000. So, you know, that that leads credence to you need, you know, either this or this, uh, you know, either one. But uh, these are, are, that's some of those things you can take care of ahead of time. And uh, I, I know... They, they cost money. I, I know that all of us are on an extremely tight budget, but I, I, you know, I'm prioritizing. And I think that's one of the things, the whole reason that I've done some of the things I do is because of some of the um, ailments that are present in my family. And, and so I want to make sure one second after uh, Bill Fortune's book, uh, one second after, where his daughter dies because there's no cold insulin available to him. They weren't able to store insulin is the whole reason why I have a solar system is the whole reason why I want to have continuous refrigeration. Uh, so, you know, so you take those things you learn from either fiction or nonfiction, and hopefully we're going to learn a lot more from nonfiction. Then you apply it and you say, what is there out there that can help me to avoid that situation? Um, I don't know best. That's, that's, you know, that is a, um, and that's the name of their party as well. Uh, you know, those are the two parties. There are those who have read the constitution and know that we have a Republic. Uh, as a matter of fact, that there's that famous exchange between, um, uh, Benjamin Franklin and the lady as he was leaving, uh, the Independence Hall in, in Philadelphia. And she says, what have you given us, sir? And he said, a republic if you can keep it. So remember the difference between a republic and a democracy is a democracy is basically mob rule, a simple majority of one rules in, in a vote, whereas um, in a republic you have rules and you have laws. So in a, in, as an example, in order to convict a person, it's not mob rule. It's not a simple majority. It has to be a unanimous decision. That's our rule of law, uh, beyond a reason of a doubt. And so, you know, there are protections. We have the the, the Bill of Rights that protects our rights, uh, so that you know the sheriff shows up. He says, "You can't hang that person. I know you voted, but you can't do it. We have to follow this set of rules, this set of laws, this set of evidence in order to convict that person of that crime." So that's the difference between democracy and republic, and, and why they keep saying we're a democracy. I have no idea. Remember. North Korea is a democracy. Remember, uh, China is a democracy. Remember, the Soviet Union was a democracy. Um, now, and quite often, um, you know, they, they uh, only had one person who was uh, on the rolls. There are there's something strange going on as well. They want to get uh, there's there's a um, proposal to add four more uh, justices to the Supreme Court because. Uh, uh, they want to get the majority back in the Supreme Court. And there's also, uh, they're, they're pushing for Puerto Rico statehood and D.C. statehood uh, so that they can add four more senators and permanently have control over the Senate. And so those are some other shenanigans that are going on right now. My opinion, D.C., <coughs> there were elements of Virginia that were given, that were ceded back from the District of Columbia to the state of Virginia. So my, my solution is take all of the residential areas, wherever a person lives in D.C., and seed it back to the state uh, in which it resides. So the vast majority of the residential buildings right now in D.C. belong to Maryland. So just say, okay, you no longer belong to the District of Columbia. You now belong to Maryland. You now have your senatorial representation that you want. There you go. 
That's Lee's solution, but you know, nobody asked Lee his opinion. Um, okay, hello, Moonsprout. Welcome. Oh, how exciting! Wow, you'll have to take some videos of it and share them, especially as a short or something like that. Uh, okay, so boss. Oh, boss. Oh, that's my. My, my eyesight, I'm sorry. So Boss Hog from uh, Dukes of Hazard. All right. Uh, let me see what else is going on here. Yes, health is truly wealth. That's, that's I, I went to the doctor today and I have a, uh, what they call a, a sportsman's hernia. And it's not really a hernia. It's not, not a weakness in the walls where anything's protruding through, but it's a weakness in the muscle where it's attached to the, uh, to the ligaments and everything. And uh, so in the abductor muscle. So I've got to get that taken care of. And that's probably uh, an after effect of my total hip replacement. You know, So we, we shall see what goes on there. But we, we're getting there. We're getting there. Amazing grandma, welcome. Um, let me see what else we got here. Okay, I think I'm caught up. So there's Amazing Grandma. That's the last one I see. We can continue on. Let me get my reading glasses back on. So the next major, I'm not going to call it a chapter. I'm going to call it a headline he has, is there is no sense but common sense when the SHTF. He says that the vast majority of peppers will die. And the reason is, is because... And, and what he so I want to read you this part that I highlighted here. It says uh, most of the peppers will need to learn to adapt and overcome. Adapting and overcoming are most used words in the survival community, but not pe many people really understand the real meaning of it. It is not only learning to live in the world without electricity; it's learning not to do only good things as we understand them today, in order that your family can live. So uh, basically, it's you know reverting back uh, to almost uh, caveman, uh, dark ages type of uh, type of stuff, and and uh, it's just um, un, un crazy. The next paragraph, he says, whenever I read words, people on on, on uh, YouTube and, and social media say, I will do this or I won't do that when SHTF happens. I feel bad because in essence, you don't know what you'll be forced to do, what you'll have to do when the day comes, because on the way you adapt and you overcome. That's what the Marines always say, adapt and overcome. Uh, not by sticking hard to your imagined, I'll only do this or I'll only do that. Uh, survival does not need to have large sense just a lot of small, everyday common senses. Um, I think a lot of us have, have designed in ourselves, you know, and, and we've seen The Walking Dead. We've seen uh, all these movies, the, the Mad Max movies. We've seen all these different things that have firmly implanted a, a vision in our mind, a National Geographic's Doomsday Preppers. We've got these images in our mind of what SHTF is going to look like. And so we have, the, we formulated with our blinders what we think we're going to do and what we're not going to do. And, and I want to adapt. There, there's this thing called Joe Harry's window. Uh, and it's J-O-H-A-R-I in case you're interested. Hello, Stealth Survivalist. Welcome. Uh, but Joe Harry's window says uh, that basically it's an interpersonal relationships type of thing. And it says, and so you have this window of four panes. And so if you look across, you say, uh, these are things that I know. Okay. And then the next one across, as you go across the, the bottom two panes are things that I don't know. Okay. Then as you look down the columns, so the first column is, you know, and then the second column is you don't know. Okay. So are things about me that I know about me that you know about me? We both know that I'm an old fart. Uh, with a terrible voice now, I used to be a professional speaker, but now my voice is gone. Uh, gray beard, you know, um, I'm into prepping. Okay, we both know that. There are things about me that you you have perceptions of me that I don't know. Okay, 
maybe perceptions of trust, maybe perceptions of like, dislike, maybe perceptions of uh, feelings of whether or not you believe that I know what I'm talking about or not. Those are all your perceptions of me that I don't know what your thoughts about me are. So I don't know what you know about me. Okay. Um, and then down we get below. I uh, So now we're going to say, I, I, uh, I don't know what you know about me, and, and I do know what you don't know about me, okay? There are some things that you don't know about me. You don't know, uh, for example, my, 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 my daughter's name, my son's name, whether or not I have a daughter or a son, my grandchildren's names. You don't know for sure how many dogs I have. There's all kinds of things about me you don't know, okay? Now, the last window down in the bottom right is there are things about me that I don't know about myself. So we can kind of translate that into there are things that I know I know. I know uh, everything that the Army has taught me about nuclear warfare, okay? I know that I have plans for food storage. I know that I have plans for water storage. I know that I have, you know, I, I, I know what I know, okay? I know that I don't know enough about ham radio. Okay, I want to learn more. I don't know enough about first aid and medical care. I, I'm not a physician. I'm not a nurse. So I really want to learn a lot more about that. There are things that I don't know what I know. So will I be, how will I react? You know, if, if all of a sudden a bright light and a mushroom cloud showed up as a reflection in my window, how would I react? Would I panic? Would I dig out my notebook and say, this is my plan, this is what I'm going to do? How would I react? I don't know what I don't know about myself, all right? I know that I don't know how I'll react, okay? Then there's the last one that's, I don't know what I don't know. So there's other things that may be happening uh, that I need to be aware of that I don't know that I don't know. And usually, um, there, there's this saying that says, and, and it's the uh, Dunning-Kruger effect. And so the person who knows the least about something believes that they're an expert in it because they don't know the full ramifications of it, ramifications of it, okay? So the more you learn about something, the more you realize that you don't know that much about it, really. There's a lot more to learn about it. So that's the opposite of Dunning-Kruger, okay? So the person, I guess Dunning-Kruger could be said to be uh, basically there's ignorance is bliss. So if you don't know, you think you're okay because you're unaware of all the things that can go on with it. So that's kind of that, that whole thing of, I don't know what I don't know. And, and maybe you don't know what you don't know, but maybe by us sharing and helping, uh, we can help each other. But that's also where interpersonal overlap comes in, because uh, I can cover from my lack of knowledge by sharing my desire to exist, my desire to survive with another person. So now we have two people. So some of their strengths are going to overshadow some of my weaknesses. Some of my strengths will overshadow some of their weaknesses. And hopefully that limits or, or, or narrows down the amount of lack of knowledge between the two of us so that we can survive together. <clears throat> Oh, that would be so fantastic. Thank you, Holly. I greatly appreciate that. Um, yeah, I was. I, I, I talked to my acupuncturist and said, can you come on and talk about holistic medicine? She said, no, uh, the hospital won't let me do that. <clears throat> I talked to my personal physician. He's a prepper. He, we talk about it every time we go in. He doesn't live that far away from me. We run into each other at Home Depot. We run into each other at... Uh, at the the the, the uh, garden center, <clears throat> and and you know, we we talk an awful lot, but he can't come on because the hospital won't let him either. Uh, then, but my oral surgeon, he's both a uh, an MD and a DDS. <clears throat> he said that he will come on, so I need to get a hold of him. And he gave me his <clears throat> he gave me a so, uh, personal uh, cell phone number, so I can get a hold of him and invite him to to talk to us. Um, and, uh, but we'll see what we can do there. So, you know, cause I have some things in my, oh, by the way, uh, do me a favor. Hello, Tofu. Would you do me a favor? Prepping by Sarge, uh, put out a phenomenal, uh, video today. 
he reviewed the Rogue Preparedness IFAC. I believe it's Rogue Preparedness. No, Rhino. Rhino. Uh, R-H-I-N-O. Rhino uh, First Aid Kit. Would you do me a favor? See if you can find that link to that uh, Prepping with Sarge Rhino First Aid Kit and link that here so everybody can watch it. It looks like a fantastic little um, uh, first aid kit that that uh, the way he tore it apart and showed it to me, I am impressed. I would buy one, uh, and that might look, be a, a fantastic. Uh, if it's within your affordability, that might be a fantastic uh, little kit for you. I'm not going to buy one. I have my money's going other places right now, and I have to kind of prioritize where my money goes. Okay. Um, so now then, the next the next portion is going to be. Uh, let me see here. The things that will surprise everyone when the SHTF happens. Um, so number one, he says, how close the fighting will be. So he has this picture in his book, and he says, one side was one faction fighting against the other side. And this is how, how wide the street was. Now, the streets in Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, those areas that are they're thousands of years old, you know, you're talking about those streets are probably wide enough for three or four people to walk down abreast. Uh, you could probably get one mule going a direction, each direction, uh, and pass each other, and that would be it. That is a typical um, Balkan area, uh, urban area. Okay. Uh, cars don't go in there. There's just not enough width for a car. And when you do have streets that are wide enough for cars, it's usually a one way street. Um, thank you. Hello, Tofu. What a wonderful, you gosh, you're so fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, take, check out this one. Uh, just do me a favor, copy, paste that, go over, open a tab, put it in there, watch it at some point in the, in the, uh, after we're done with the live tonight, just save it. That's a fantastic first aid kit. Strongly recommend it. <clears throat> okay, so he talks about how close the fighting is going to be. Uh, that, you know, that you're going to be neighbor against neighbor, family member against family member. Um, he says it's the most dangerous aspect of urban SHTF because you'll have a lot of people in a relatively small area. You'll have a higher demand for very limited resources because... The system is gone. And so all those things that you think about, the convenience store, the Sam's, the Walmarts, the, the grocery stores, the gas stations, the Home Depots, all those things that you take for, for granted right now are not going to be there in a post-apocalyptic world. And so you're going to have to come up with those things. You're going to have to have them from other people. Access to medical care, access to dental care access to prescription medications, uh, all those things get lost. And that's what he's talking about. You're going to have to adapt in order to survive. <clears throat> so we can take some of that. We can say we can kind of mitigate this and plan for it. Um, like, I, I, like I continue to tell you one of my biggest fears, I've got three uh, Luggable Lou porta potties <clears throat> I've got, oh gosh, 60, I've got at least 360 rolls. Uh, no. Eight, eight times 60 is 480. I've got at least 480 rolls of toilet paper. <clears throat> I've got at least five bags of, uh, of, of um, red disposable, what do they call it? Um, um, anyhow, waste bags that, that, that are for contaminated, medical contamination and stuff like that. Uh, and then I'm going to be putting those that that's going to be human waste inside of contractor bags. I probably got five boxes of contractor bags and then that's going to be buried in a pit. And I've got the, the stuff I'm going to pour onto it that you use for septic tanks that, that eat up all the solids and all that kinds of stuff. I've got that take. Thank you. Biohazard bag. Thank you. Little lone prepper. Gosh, I'm so happy you guys are able to read my mind when I'm short sighted like that. Um, but, um, you know, I've got that taken care of, but my next door neighbor may not. And so their fecal matter, their urine and stuff like that is going to start rolling over into my yard. It's going to attract the rodents, the insects, the, 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 the scummy stuff. 
And uh, so I have to be prepared. How am I going to survive against my neighbors, not just myself? So, you know, take all that stuff for granted. Say, what happens if? And then what happens if I can't do that? Um, hello, Prepping with Sarge. Take a look at the chat just a little bit up above. And uh, let me see if I can get it here. There you go. Well, I've got it right there. Hello, Tofu put it up there for you. I was telling people how you did such a great charge with that Rhino um, first aid kit and, and told everybody to bookmark that and go look at it when they're done with this video tonight. And uh, because I think that's a great little uh, first aid kit if it's affordable for them. You know, from the looks of it, it's probably going to be an expensive kit because of how well it was put together. Um, yes. And he talks about that in one of his other books, Holly. You're absolutely right. Uh, that fire starting was was one of the most important things. And and he said just the big lighter was was worth, you know, unbelievable amounts. He also talks in his other book about how candles, and this is something else that we forget to talk about as preppers. Now, we, quite often we'll get into a discussion and it gets heated because you're talking nuclear warfare and I'm talking financial collapse. And those two scenarios have different ways of prepping for them, have different things we're going to prioritize. Uh, but then once we agree on we're going to talk about one calamity, then we fail to identify. I'm talking about the very beginning when things are first happening and they haven't started to settle down versus six months out versus a year out when things start settling. For example, precious metals. Uh, everybody says precious metals have no place whatsoever in a post-apocalyptic world. I'm going to say they probably do not. You are probably right if we're talking about the first oh, three to six months in a post-apocalyptic world. But once we start to see markets forming, once we start to see people coming together and looking for a common denomination of trade, a monetary unit, then I see precious metals as being very valuable. Uh, you know, at the very beginning, I'll give you a, a pack of cigarettes for your Zippo lighter, you know, if we can agree on that. Number one, it's going to be a hard time finding somebody with a Zippo lighter. Number two, it's going to be a hard time finding somebody with cigarettes. But we're going to just say, theoretically, we've got the two people agreeing to it. They agree that that's a, a good exchange, and they exchange, okay? <clears throat> that's going to be very, very few and far between. The more likely thing is, I want your Zippo lighter, uh, but you don't want my tobacco. You'd rather have alcohol. Well, I've got to go find somebody to trade my tobacco to get alcohol with. And then come back and bring that alcohol to your Zippo lighter. If you still haven't haven't found somebody else to trade with before I got all that other stuff taken care of, so that's going to be that's going to be made easier in a in a market situation. So that's where you're going to have currencies, and I think that maybe even dollar bills. I don't know. Maybe maybe American coinage, maybe European coinage, but I do know gold and silver have always had value. Uh, I mean, remember. That's what, that's what Pharaoh used. That's what Caesar used. Uh, Jesus was betrayed for, for silver. Uh, silver was used in the Jewish temple. I mean, gold was used in the Jewish temple. Those have been um, the measurements of monetary units for, for at least, let's say, 4,000 years. So chances are that they will come back. Uh, Stealth Survivalist says, look at New York. Uh, they're trying to place ref refugees into people's homes. Yes, and the, the, the mayor of New York has an 18-room mansion. I wonder how many of his rooms he's giving up uh, for those. Um, and I'm not going to call them refugees. I'm, I'm, I'm not politically correct. I'll call them what they are, and that is illegal aliens who have invaded our country. Uh, yes, the link that I will put will have my affiliate code on it so that I get the 2% of that when you when you get it. Uh, so that was little alone prepper helping me out. Gosh, she is so fantastic. Um, let me see here. And uh, then we have Prepping with Sarge showed up. That's great. One of my favorites. Uh, and his live is every Friday night. And I strongly recommend that you do it with, with him. Uh, I like talking to him because uh, one of the main things, you know, I, I, want to get people's minds ready for what we're going to be seeing when SHTF happens. And, you know, we've got to get our minds ready for that. We've got to train our minds to think abnormally because abnormality is going to be the normalcy. 
And so he is just, he's phenomenal at, at working with people and, and helping people sort things out in their minds and stuff. So make sure you subscribe to his channel and visit him on Friday nights for his lives. Um, oh, he says it's on sale for now. So, and what can you put up? Do you have a link or, or something, or do they just need to go to your channel and look at that video and, and you, you provide it in the, in the, uh, in the comments afterwards? Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. We So very good comment, James. Thank you for bringing that up. I'm so glad I have such great people in chat. Yes, you want to make sure to prevent other people's sewage from backing up into your sewage, especially if you're at a lower elevation than other people on that line. Make sure you turn off the ball valve at the street so that it doesn't back up into your house. If it backs up, it'll go to the next place up. So it's always looking for an easy way out shut off that easy way out into your home. Um, let me see. I'll tell you what, I have a plumber who, who I eat breakfast with every Tuesday morning and uh, I'll see if I can't get him uh, on here to talk to us about how to take care of some of that stuff when, when things happen. Um, let me see where we are. Isn't it great? Um, now, I, I tell you, so I, I kind of, I, I love the kit. I would like to amend it, but I also have a rule. And that my rule is I'm trying to standardize the IFAC among my group. <clears throat> and because I'm, I'm retired Army. And so for 21 years, we had the same IFAC. We were in the same place upside down on the left side of your LBE. <clears throat> so you can reach up and grab it down and it falls into your hands. We know exactly you use your own first aid kit on yourself. You never use it on somebody else. So if you come across somebody who needs first aid, you open theirs, you know where everything is because they're all packed exactly the same. Everything looks exactly the same. So I am a strong proponent in my group. I insist that everybody have the same IFAC. Well, I went with Echo Sigma's IFAC at the time, uh, simply because that was the best one on the market that I could find at the time to have what it, what I wanted. Uh, if I were to do it all over again, now that I see this Rhino kit uh, that Prepping with Sarge recommended. Um, okay, take care, Prepping with Sarge. Thanks for dropping in. Um, don't forget to leave a thumbs up. Um, but uh, anyhow, um, I would recommend what he showed. Um, I would add something additional to it. Uh, I don't think you can ever have enough triangular bandages. I don't think you can ever have enough gauze, especially if you're going to pack a wound. You know, that is stick the gauze down inside the wound to, to, to stop the bleeding. Uh, so gauze, I don't think anybody, any kit ever has enough gauze. I don't think any kit ever has enough uh, triangular bandages. Uh, yeah, and there's also, you want to get a special tool. Um, you want to get, when I was in CERT, uh, they gave us a special magnesium uh, tool so that when you're turning off your gas uh, you, and you have that metal on metal contact, so you're turning it, you're not having any sparks because if you've got a gas leak and you're trying to turn off the gas to keep an explosion from happening, you don't want to have sparks. That will cause an, an explosion. So you want to have a non-sparking tool to turn off your gas meter so you don't have gas coming into the into your house that could cause something. Um, Okay. Um, oh, wow. Fantastic. You, so lucky. My next door neighbor and over here, guy across the street and the guy next door is over here. Uh, we're all in it together as well. And then I have two other people here in the neighborhood. So, so we're kind of uh, doing that. I was talking with a guy today and, uh, uh, but he's, he's an armorer. And uh, so he's uh he, he's uh, interested in coming and, and meeting with our people and, and seeing whether or not we're a good fit, fit with him or not. Okay. Okay, so now the things that will surprise you most when SHTF happens. Number one, we were talking about how close the fighting will be. Uh, 
A lot of people are in a small area, relatively few supplies that people are fighting over. Number two, the enemy will look, sound, speak just like you. So if we come to revolution in, internal to the U.S., uh, I, I think that that's going to be one of the toughest things. You know, it's easy back in 1860, North versus South, Blue versus Gay, uh, Southern Accent versus Northern Accent. I come from El Paso, which is far West Texas. We talk totally different from an East Texan or a Southeast Texan. Uh, my wife's accent in Central Texas uh, farming community is totally different from mine. You can tell that we come from different parts of Texas. But that doesn't give any ideas to our ideologies, what we believe or how we believe. Uh, so that's going to be the tough part is how do you identify who the enemy is? Uh, so unless you self-identify, then you don't know who the enemy is. And so my recommendation to you is to be as gray as possible. And uh, so by being gray, what I mean is take any symbols off your car, any bumper stickers that promote one side against the other. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter. I, I, I think I told you I bought a bumper sticker a couple of years ago. And, and the number of people who don't realize that uh, uh, until uh, 1517, when, when uh, Martin Luther broke away, all Christians were Roman Catholics. And then Martin Luther broke away. So then it formed the Protestant Revolution in 1517. And then James Wesley and a couple others followed after him. But the, the amount of intense hatred people... Little Baptists and 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 uh, Church of Christ, who think that Roman Catholics aren't Christians, they they really believe that we are not Christians, and uh, so I decided, you know what, I'm not going to put that on my truck. Uh, as much as I would like to proclaim to people that I believe, uh, you know, I don't think people would take it that way. They would take it as an as an act of aggression rather than as a statement of, of my commitment to Jesus. So you know. Uh, even I am doing that. Uh, on, the back, on the back of my car, I have U.S. Army retired. I have uh, an American flag. I have a Texas flag. And I have the Military Intelligence Corps crest. And if you know if you know the Military Intelligence Corps crest, you know, but uh, that's it. So if you're an MI guy, you know what, that I'm an MI guy. And uh, if you're retired Army, you know that I'm retired Army. Of course, my, my license plate here in Texas, we have disabled veteran plates. Uh, so as a disabled veteran, I, I get disabled veterans plates, but uh, that's about it. That's all you can tell out of my, out of my, uh, out of that. So uh, fighting will be divided by all sorts of reasons, race, religion, affiliation, heritage, politics, and often a mix of those things. And sometimes just for survival, um, how busy an average day was. So fighting for survival is an all day, every day task. You're constantly hunting, scavenging, gathering, finding information, looking and checking things, all while the most stressed you have ever been in your life and under constant threat of your life from others, all while being hungry, thirsty, and deprived of sleep. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I laugh when, when I, the, his first book, he stressed this, um, um, and, and then, um, Furfall stresses it, so does uh, Venezuelan Prepper. For those of you who are getting games and cards and stuff, there's not going to be time for games and cards and stuff. Uh, you're going to be constantly busy. Uh, you know, in order to get wood to burn, to cook, uh, you've got to cure it for six months. So you got to be out starting getting your wood now and then procuring that as other people are procuring it. We have not used wood burners for quite a while. So there's going to be an, a big demand on wood. So that means it's going to go further and further out into the non-existing forest that we have in order to get the wood to burn and in order to cook. Uh, if you haven't started preparing, you know, stocking up on gas and charcoal and things like that now, um, then, you know, there, there's so many things and we're going to be, if we, if we run out of fuel, if we, if we have an EMP and we don't, we can't use electricity or gas, and, and gas-fired vehicles after the tanks that they currently have are, are, are basically used up, we're going to have to be dependent upon horses. We don't have anywhere close to the horse population we had in the late 1800s, early 1900s. It's just totally unbelievable. Uh, and we don't have any of the tack, uh, saddles and, and, and harnesses and, and all that kinds of stuff. So that's going to be very difficult as well. Uh, let me get up here real quick.
Um, let me see if I can't get Mark to answer some of these questions for us. Gun club stickers, tactic, cool look, uh, dress for attention, show off cars and wealth is old school and puts you at risk. You are so correct, stealth survivalist. Thank you. And don't show what your family is. If you've got those stick figures of a dad and a mom and three little babies and five dogs, get that off your car. That's that's going to make you a target, um, you know, because they know that you're going to spend as much time watching after those children as you are watching after your home. So, you know, th th that can be a distraction for you. That can be something that can make you a target. Remove anything off your cars, your house or anything else that's going to make you a target. Um, uh, number, number four, uh, the level of the threat. In SHTF, almost everything is a threat to you. Yes, easy to understand threats like snipers, gangs, angry neighbors, but the lack of food, uh, the lack of hygiene, the lack of uh, or the level of contamination, the risk of illness and injury, being found or discovered, being informed on, being tricked, people selling you out, getting captured, and many, many more make up a larger amount of the threats than you can ever imagine. So, you know, I mean, it's going to be desperate times. And when thing, when times are desperate, People do desperate things. People will sell out their families in order to survive. And, you know, read Viktor Frankl's books. Read Abraham Maslow's books on what happened uh, to the Kopis uh, as they were trying to survive in Auschwitz and Birkenau and Bergen-Belsen and uh, all the different concentration camps in, in World War II. You know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs was based upon him observing uh, other Jews in the concentration camp and the different emotional levels they had trying to fight for survival and, and how that, uh, how that happened. And so he was able to formulate an entire field of psychology based on that. Just, it, it's going to be terrible and, and, and we aren't going to have time to adjust. So that's why we have to kind of start getting that mindset now of being prepared for what is going to be pure hell on earth once it does happen. Uh, and the reality of defending your assets, uh, you know, that you're going to be required, you're going to be asked, you're going to be required to do terrible things, unimaginable things in order to protect your family, to defend your family, to survive yourself. Uh, remember, you've got to take care of yourself. You know, it's the same thing as on an airplane. Uh, I don't know how many people have flown, uh, but when the stewardess, I'm sorry, you don't call those that anymore. When the, when the flight attendant, uh, gets up and gives you the safety briefing at the beginning, what do they say? In the case of a cabin emergency depressurization and the masks fall down, put your mask on first before you put it on your child. Because if you put it on your child first and you, and you put it on incorrectly, you don't put it on yours and you expire, you're not going to be able to take care of your kid. So you got to take care of your first, yourself first so you can take care of your kid. So that's the same thing in an SHTF uh, situation. You got to take care of yourself in order for you to survive, so you can take care of the others. So sometimes that may mean, you know, what the, one of the worst things that I ever experienced was in CERT, uh, the Community Emergency Response Team. Uh, they taught us, you know, how, how to do triage in a, in a mass casualty event. And so one of the things we have to do is we have to we have to take a look at a person and say, this person is going to die regardless of what I do and be willing to walk past them to assist somebody who can live with my assistance. So being able to identify those who are dead and there's nothing you can do about it. You can, you can put a tourniquet on them and they're going to be, there's no surgeon available to take that tourniquet off. So what are you doing by putting that tourniquet on? Don't move, you know, acknowledge the fact that that person is going to die and move on to the next one and help them because there may be that they can survive with your help. So those are going to be some of the tough calls that we're going to have to make in, in, in an SHTF survival situation that I don't think people have really clearly thought about and, and thought through. Um, and that's why it's so important that we do this together. We have to be together um, and, and of like mind and sharing and, and helping and aiding uh, in order to get through because a lone wolf is not going to survive this situation. You have to sleep sometime. You have to expose yourself. You're going to, you know, like I, like I tell people, one of my biggest fears 
was we had we had these gallows. So in the army, you have these 55 in, in, in a combat zone, you have these 55 gallon uh, oil drums that you use for, for sewage. <clears throat> so then you have this kind of like gallows that sets up over it with your toilet on top of that and you drop down into the 55 gallon drum. Well, that means you're, you know, four or five feet above normal height. <clears throat> so my big fear was getting getting snipered and, and falling into that bucket. Um, you know, that's the way it's going to be. You're going to be exposed when you go to the bathroom. You're going to be exposed when you're getting water. You're going to be exposed while you're chopping wood. You're going to be exposed while you're exposed. You know, I mean, uh, how do we mitigate that? How do we take care of that? Well, the only way we can do that is by having somebody else cover our back and by being a team. Okay. So let me see if there's any more comments here. Uh, James Carroll, gosh, you've had some fantastic comments. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, way to go, Holly. I, I wholeheartedly agree with your your uh, emotions, and but I, I, I applaud your wisdom uh, not to make that known. Because remember, right now we're right at 50-50. So that means for every person who applauds and says, I agree with you, there's one person who says, I hate you and I want to do away with you. So, you know, that, that's a very wise decision not to, uh, not to publicly proclaim that. Uh, yes, and, and cell phones as well. <clears throat> oh, by the way, if there are any hams in here, I am looking for expert advice on the best 20 meter to two centimeter transceiver that affordable. I want to get an HF receiver. I want to get a, a, a 20 meter the two centimeter transceiver um, and then uh, a good, probably a J uh, antenna uh, capable of both 20 meter and two centimeter and, you know, put all that together for around a thousand dollars. That's, that's the max budget I can do for that. So if anybody here has any ideas on how you can help me with that and make some recommendations, I would greatly, greatly appreciate that. Um, Tracy, I'm going to make a prediction. And, and uh, let's, let's say our prayers that I am wrong. I think it's going to happen before the end of summer. Uh, a couple of things have happened. So we, we, we know that the Chinese are constantly pushing us. They had a destroyer basically cut off one of our destroyers. They were within 150 yards of each other. Our destroyer almost rammed theirs because they, they did one of those crossing things. The Syrians are becoming more aggressive in the uh, Iranian Sea. Uh, we've got Israel... And, and its neighbors, you know, doing things again. Uh, today, Saudi Arabia announced that they're going to reduce their oil production by a million gallons a day. Uh, I'm sorry, a million barrels a day. <clears throat> um, a, a, a hole appeared in that dam on the Dnieper, and uh, the Russians are blaming the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians are blaming the Russians. We don't know. All we know is now there's a whole bunch of Ukrainian villages downstream on the Dnieper or downriver <clears throat> that are in danger. Uh, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is in danger. There's all kinds of stuff that the Crimean Peninsula is in danger. <clears throat> it looks like the Ukrainian counteroffensive has star started. It looks like the Russian counter counteroffensive has started. Um, there's claims of, you know, that Putin is accusing NATO of things. NATO is accusing Putin of things. We've got a major NATO exercise coming up in the next couple of days. Biggest one ever. <clears throat> that can be seen as a threat by Putin. He has moved a whole bunch of tactical nukes into Belarusia. There, the world is crazy. Uh, Goshen prepping. I, 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 if, if you watch him and popular preparedness, both of them had some fantastic things today about um, you know the, the economy. Uh, popular preparedness says yes, we are definitely going to be in a depression by the end of the year. Um, and he's a financial. Uh, a certified financial planner. So I, I think I trust him on that. <clears throat> you know, we got an awful lot of people saying an awful lot of things. Gosh, the fires that are happening right now in, in Canada, that's strange. Um, excessive amount of smoke along the entire Eastern seaboard. Um, tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about the fact that there have been 30,000 Chinese, uh, unaccompanied Chinese males of military age have come across the Southern border into the United States over the course of, well, since uh, Jan Inauguration Day 2021, okay? That's six divisions worth of military-capable men. And we only have 12 active divisions in the U.S. Army. 
So, you know, what's going to happen? So tomorrow night, we're going to talk about that. You know, that could happen at any time. So <clears throat> we had the North Koreans launch an ICBM. It was supposedly to launch a satellite up into space. We don't know whether it's going to be an ICBM or whether it's going to be a satellite in space. We don't know what the satellite in space is going to be. Is it going to be for intelligence purposes? Is it going to be for EMP purposes? We don't know. We've got more Chinese spy balloons coming over. <coughs> They've been stopped, thank goodness, before they got to us. So much crazy stuff going on in the world. And then, of course, inside the U.S., we got this going on. So it's impossible to focus against the external threats because there are so many internal threats as well. And one of my pet peeves, we've got the third Saturday in, in May, we celebrate Armed Forces Day. One day to say, and most people don't even know it exists, one day to tell the active duty military, we appreciate you. Then the last Monday in May, we have one day to tell all the people who have died serving our republic, thank you for forfeiting your life so that we can be free. And now we are in LBGTQ plus month. Shows us where our priorities are, doesn't it? But anyhow, um, that's Lee's take on it. I'm sorry. I get on my get on my high horse and I get a little bit upset. Um, take a couple more of these comments and then we're running over and I'll I will uh, we will whoops one of my tabs what happened it bent first Peter bent in my Bible. I guess because of the way I put it up. Um, absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Um, we just can't do it, you know. And and there is no vetting. You know, they, they come from countries where there is no way to vet them. So you know that's going to be another thing is the number of people who are here who are not of the best quality. I'm not saying that everybody who comes across is not a good quality. I'm just saying that there are some bad bad apples who have come across with them. Okay, Poplar's a CPA, not an SCFP. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, thank you, Still Survival. I appreciate that. Um, so, you know, and, and read the two colonels books. Um, so, uh, that's called unrestricted warfare. Uh, the two Chinese colonels from the, uh, people's liberation army Navy wrote a book on how they intend to defeat the United States without even looking like an attack. So you take a look at all these disparate things that are happening throughout our country, you know, a fire here, an explosion here, a plant taken down here, a train wreck here, uh, you know, 15,000 cows dying in an unexplained explosion here. All these different things that are happening that's predicted in their book, Unrestricted Warfare, where you'll have all these little things that nobody can tell. They can't put the dots together. And that's Unrestricted Warfare. Lieutenant General Flynn wrote a fantastic book called Fifth Generation Warfare, which is basically the same thing. Read both of those and you can put the dots together because the dots the, the, the dots that they're talking about, whoops, I went, let me, you know, here, uh, because the dots are not dots. The, you know, the, the fact that you can't put them together makes them more su suspicious uh, of what the Chinese want to do. Um, that's highly probable. That's, I, I've seen that happen before. Uh, let me see here if there's anything else. Okay. Sorry about the fires this week and the air quality on the East Coast. The USA will experience problems. I was I was watching uh, the news earlier today. You know the one city that has the highest level of bad air quality because of the fires in Canada? They're saying the worst place in the U.S. right now for bad bad smoke from the fires is El Paso, Texas, my hometown. How about that? Okay. Well, let's bring this to a close here. Um uh, Wow. So, okay. Amazing grandma says that uh, she's getting smoke in Northern Wisconsin. I believe little known prepper is saying that they're getting smoke in North Carolina. El Paso, Texas has uh, extreme health hazard warning out. Uh, what do you think about that? All, all this historical stuff about uh, how, how the, uh, 
um, politics of, of the Great Depression. Unbelievable stuff. Let me know what you think about it when you get done, James. Appreciate that. Okay, so here we are. The, the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verses 24, 25, and 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you kindly and give you peace. So do me a favor. Number one, join me tomorrow night. We're going to talk about these 30, you know, what can these 30,000 Chinese be up to? What are some of the things that they might be doing? How do we prepare for that in advance? What are some of the things that we need to keep in mind as all this free-flowing stuff across the border is happening? Um, and then you might want to do a little bit of, of uh, investigation before tomorrow night as well. And maybe you can add some stuff to it that, that, that I haven't even thought about and just some, some great conversation tomorrow night as well. Remember that we're all in this together so we can come out the other side together. You know, we've got to do this as a team. We've got to support each other. As you've done in the chat, add, correct, um, be kind to each other. Please be kind, polite, and respectful to each other. We have to love each other uh, as he loved us so that we can make it through this together. We have to overlook each other's idiosyncrasies, overcome and adapt and react and love because togetherness is the key. Thank you ever, ever so much for being here this evening. I greatly appreciate all of you. Uh, do me a favor, share if you think it's worthwhile. Like, subscribe, we greatly appreciate it. I'm working on the gifts now for the 5,000 subscriber giveaway. Everybody have a wonderful evening. Take care. Bye-bye.